welcome Jessica Lady Ada. Hey everybody and welcome to my desk. It's me Lady Ada. This is my desk covered in all sorts of stuff including some floppy drives which we'll be talking about shortly. Uh, do you have any news or updates Mr. Lady Ada before we get um, into Lots of shows this week. Uh, look to Hack a Day. I think we're doing a hack chat this week. So. Oh yeah we're doing a hack chat. Yeah so look for that and more and uh Let's kick it off. What's okay. on your desk this week? All right. So this week on my desk, I've got all sorts of floppy drives. I'm getting back to a project that I worked on kind of over COVID part shortage time, which was um, integrating, uh, interfacing with floppy drives. And um, this is a, like a laptop floppy disk. And this is a uh, desktop three and a half. And this is an Apple. Um, and I also have a five and a quarter floating around here somewhere. Probably will fall on my head later tonight. Um, so floppy drives are kind of neat. Uh, you can, there's a lot of people with floppy disks collections from like the nineties and, um, it would be really good to be able to get all that data off and especially for like archival reasons, um, you know, historical reasons. Like I know my parents have a bunch of stuff on floppy and I would love to keep that around because, um, floppy drives do, do floppy disks do degrade, like the magnetics, um, start to, uh, they can flake off um or they can slowly become demagnetized so um you know we did this project and go to the computer where um we wrote a bunch of code in circuit python and arduino to kind of start the process of interfacing with floppies and we did a bunch of videos and we're going to get back to it um we just took a break basically like all these parts came back into stock and so we wanted to work on all those and all those redesigns we did like 400 redesigns Another thing is that the original code for um, the floppy stuff was all going to be with a SAMD51. And like, as I say, like almost every video, I can't get SAMD51s until 2024, like mid or late 2024. And that's like their current estimate, which means, you know, whatever. Um, I'll probably get some here and there, but for the most part, everything has to move over RP2040. So, um, you know, we did the floppy feather wing which was kind of just me getting like, okay, let's get something going so we can easily test it. And it's got um, a two by 17 header on one side and on the back, it's got uh, level shifters because floppy drives are all five volt logic uh, and five volt power, which we'll talk about in a minute. And um, so you need to, if you want to interface with a three volt microcontroller like the RP2040, um, you're definitely going to want to have your up shifters, kind of like NeoPixels, right? You want to go from three volt up to five volt. Uh, and that's what where the uh, 245 series uh, comes in handy. Um, eight, each one of these does eight bits. And, you know, floppy, you can look at some of the previous videos, but floppy disks are not, um, they have a very weird interface where the data streams out in this encoded bit width format it's very low level and so you do need to have a very fast processor or PIO um, which is why the RP2040 is, is actually really great for doing floppy interfacing stuff because you can use a PIO to read in these these variable bit widths it's kind of like reverse NeoPixel like the data is coming in and it's like you know a wide bit and a low like a like it's up and down up and down and it's not like Manchester encoding but it's like the the width of the bit within the cycle tells you um, the width of the pulse within the cycle tells you uh, whether it's a one or a zero. Um, so timer inputs are really good for it. But again, PIO will do the job as well. And then there's, you know, you have to step the motor and you have to set the direction and you can set which side, which head you want to read from. Um, so a lot of pins are required um, to do this so that we got the floppy feather wing out, you know, a couple months ago. And it definitely um, works. Here it is, you know, plugged into your standard floppy drive. But there's a couple... There's a couple of things that while this was good, I wanted to do more. One, um, the floppy feather wing was hard coded. The way I set up the direction was it could only read from, sorry, it could read and write from diskettes, but it was meant to be connected to a floppy disk drive. It couldn't emulate being a floppy. And that's something that could be kind of interesting too. There's a lot of um, devices, um, you know, for example, I, I've worked with, um, knitting machines and like a lot of knitting machines like the old brother kh series require floppy drives there's a there's actually like a not insignificant number of old machines that expect you to have a floppy disk drive connected up to them and so i know you can buy floppy disk emulators but you know i thought like oh like i really like doing open source hardware and making sure that we can have forever 
um, hardware. Like this would, will always be able to be emulated or read. So um, even though you can buy this sort of thing off the shelf, I thought it'd be kind of cool to re-implement it. So one thing about the floppy featherwing, like I mentioned, it can only connect to a drive. It can't act like a drive. Um, another thing, it isn't good for connecting to laptop um, floppy disks. So let's go to the overhead real fast and I'll show this because it's kind of interesting in case you didn't know. Um, so this is your standard, uh, it's kind of handy. You can tilt this over and I can, you can see, pardon me. Okay, so um, this is your standard uh, floppy interface. Um, go right side up. Uh, so you see that this is a uh, paper phenolic PCB, and there's a little notch in it, and there's even one pin missing. Although uh, most cables don't have the the extra pin there, and it's hard to hold it still. Um, and these are the uh, interface pins, so IF2 through 34. So it's a 2 by 17 connector. And every other pin is grounded. So like one row is all grounded, and then the rest are like, it's basically like data stepper, index, um, direction, um, write, protect, write, enable, write, whatever. All the pins are um, on this top end. And then you also have the power, which is kind of nice here. It's connected. And um, these three and a half inch only use five volt. They don't use 12 volts, but the larger um, disk drives do the five and a quarters use 12 volts and five volts. So even though this one only has five volts here, um, it's not uncommon to need 12 volts as well. Laptop floppy drives are much smaller and you can even see You can see this beautiful um, little stepper motor here, which is used to um, feed the head back and forth. And then there's another spinning motor. It's very flat, but there's a very flat motor over there, which spins and also uses five volts. But instead of having this big chonky ass connector, it has um, this, uh, I think it's 24 pin. FPC one millimeter pitch. So it has a slightly different connector, but it was interesting. It's actually easier to get laptop um, floppy drives are much more available than the, the chunky, um, you know, uh, PC tower style. Um, so I also wanted to make sure that, you know, the board that I designed has a connector for the laptop style. And um, the five volt comes through here as well, by the way, which is uh, kind of handy. You don't need a separate connector for them. And then, um, in addition to that, I also wanted to support, you know, weird drives like, you know, five and a quarter uh, Apple style. So, um, you know, I've got this, I'm sorry, a little dusty, but this is um, in a clear case, which means you can really see the dust. And uh, so it's got this custom controller, uh, which is beautiful, designed by Waz. And then on the end, it's got a, uh, I don't count is two by two by 12 i think two by two by 10 um connector which has i think plus minus 12 and five volts and then four raw stepper pins like you get the bipolar stepper pin control so you don't do like direction and step you're like hi i am like toggling each pin um and then the data streaming out similar style as the um uh laptop or desktop style and then a couple other probably control signal pins and whatever um so i wanted to also connect to these uh so this is another connector and then um while i was there i was like you know what like maybe i'll also have it be able to connect to scuzzy uh discs ide i feel like you can get ide to sata converter so like that's not of much value but um scuzzy could be useful so back here um okay so let's go to the computer and i'll show my draft so far so it's really like i've just been slowly putting things down you know thinking about it um so the size of the pcb is the size of a uh standard floppy disk and a half inch floppy um so i've got the laptop flop so this is the now I'm, now I'm like, what, how many pins is it? 26 pin, one millimeter pitch, 
laptop connector. This is your standard 2x17 IDE floppy drive, like your standard uh, PC floppy disk. And this is SCSI, which is you know, like 50 pins, by the way. Do you guys remember that? It's, um, it's an 8080 style. So it has eight bits of data, read latch, write latch, IRQ, busy, whatever, all those pins. Not a, um, it seems like, oh my God, 50 pins, but every other pin is ground, which, you know, they didn't have differential. They didn't use differential signaling at the time. So instead they would just ground every other pin um, to avoid having crosstalk. Um, and then this is the, um, I think this is the maintenance lock amp 350211. So this is the standard um, connector used for powering um, like disk drives and floppies. And um, we have these, these are called like, I think I call them Molex IDE. Oops. So they're like this connector, right? Which is your standard. This is what this plugs into that um connector and what you can do is you can get um it's easy to get like splitter so this is a splitter that goes from um that power connector to floppy but you can get ones that are like multiple ones so like basically it's an adapter um because this is the floppy um disconnector you know ground 12 volt 5 volt and um this is the you know molex to berg Although they're not, it's not Molex. It's like apparently amp. I don't know. It's, it's a very weird, the, the, the um, names of these are not consistent anyways, but you can get these, these cables are easy to get. So I thought I would um, put this connector on here. I was going to actually do a right angle one. It's just for, just to kind of remind me not to forget putting this power connector here because it, it'll stick down, not up. But I put this here just to kind of give me the placement. And then I have to do, there's going to be like a lot of level shifting. Like, obviously I'm going to share, there's not enough pins to do all of them in, at the same time. Um, so what I'll have to do is um, kind of interleave whatever pin. So you obviously don't connect a floppy and a SCSI and a disk to all at the same time. You pick whichever one you want to connect. And then I'd have enough GPIO um, on here to connect to, definitely to connect to SCSI. Because don't forget, you lose four pins to the QSPY interface, and then you need two pins for I squared C, and then I want um, a micro SD card. Micro SD card, I thought I had a couple of ideas. One, if you're emulating a device, obviously you could have your files on the micro SD card, but I thought it would also be kind of neat if it did um, standalone floppy disk reading, because normally what you do is you connect this to your computer, and then you run Grease Weasel or whatever on your computer and it sucks the data off and it saves it to your disk drive. But um, I could see there are situations where you're like, look, I'm going to go to a place and maybe I don't have, I want to do a lot of them. And I don't want to get, because you only have one connected to your computer at a time. If you want to do multiple in parallel, you can't do it. But these standalone, maybe with some buttons, you know, you have some buttons here, you could control it. And then there's a STEM IQT port here. You could connect an OLED. Um, and, uh, you know, or maybe I could like take advantage of the SCSI connector and you can like connect a display that way somehow or something. But then when you plug in your disk drive, you can say dump the raw data or dump the IDE, uh, the um, PC fat, you know, red data, or try to read it as fat. If you manage to read all of it without any CRC errors, cool. If not, then, you know, I can go and get a raw um, data dump. Um, so that could be useful because you can put any size um, micro SD card here for a lot of storage. And then um, NeoPixel, and I'm going to have like some LEDs for 3 volt, 5 volt, 12 volt power. Um, for the disk 2, I'm going to need to also, uh, yes, 2 by 10. Um, I'm also going to need a negative 12 volt power. I think it's, yeah, it's plus minus 12. The negative 12 is not like a high volt, high current output. It's used for biasing um, the trimmer that is like used for tweaking, I think like either the speed or like the offset. There's like this trimmer on the board. Cause I was wondering like, what's the 12 volt used for? And then you can, you know, you that's, it's just a small amount of current. So I'll need, um, 12 volt high current because for big disk drives, the motor is usually 12 volt, five volt high current, negative 12 volt, like not so high current. 
Um, and then of course, three volt for the RP2040 over here. Um, so I'm still, you know, working on it. Um, kind of thinking like picking and choosing the components. Um, you know, NeoPixel, STEM QT. I think I'll have enough GPIO for all this. Like I haven't like really started doing serious noodling, but I, I'm pretty sure um, there's enough. One thing I did is I, I wired up the um, uh, micro SD card as SPI or SDIO um, because I thought that could be handy if you needed high speed reading. Now, you usually don't get higher speed writing with SDIO because the write speed of a MMC of a of SD card is based on how fast you can erase blocks on the internal microcontroller. So you don't you don't get a lot of benefit for doing SDIO for writing usually, um, unless you have like a a high speed card like a card that's designed for high speed erasing like for cameras. Um, but for reading it could be good. And if you know I, I we did verify that this pinout works. Like you can have um the spi and sdio pins interleaved and and you can use either one with the sd card um and then you know i'll put eight megabytes of uh q spy flash maybe if you're doing just a couple you're reading like one disk you could read it and save it to the internal flash memory or you could like emulate from the internal flash memory um because we have really good support for that and then um yeah, I think so that, you know, it's it's kind of nowhere near ready. I mean, for the, I got to start wiring up these. This is a, again, because I want to have it be bi-directional. You can either read or emulate. Um, I need to have a full three to five volt bi-directional translator. Um, so I've used these before, the 74 LVC 8T series. So you get two um, power pins, VCC A and VCC B and it can do high to low. Now you're probably wondering, why don't you just use a TXB0108? Doesn't the TXB0108 do everything? No, the TXB0108 does not handle pull-ups. It freaks out. And I, I, I'm not, I think the TXB108 and friends are very, very cool, but they're not good for a situation like this where the direction should be fixed. Like you, it shouldn't auto detect which direction because again, it'll be weirded out by pull-ups. It's weirded out by signals that aren't like purely digital. And I think sometimes when you're reading, um, you've got these 2.2 K pull-ups on the floppy. And I think like, it's just going to be freaked out by them because a lot of this is open drain. And the TXS series is also like kind of weird. So I'm going to go with this and just, I'm going to have to manually control the direction. Um, and I might have a switch, like a mechanical switch. So it's like, hey, do you want to have it emulator mode or in reading mode, like it interfacing mode? And then you can switch between the two of them. So the goal here is just to have, you know, I may not get every interface working in both directions, but the idea is to have a, like a truly open source hardware, easy to manufacture, um, all in one board that kind of does every retro interface. I don't know, maybe I'll throw on some headers. You can do like a Commodore 64 interface too, which is like your, it's very weird. It's not, um, it's not any of these lower level interfaces. Anyways, um, so, you know, kind of like poking and prodding. It's going to take me a couple of weeks to get this together because there's, there's a lot going on. Another thing I was thinking about that would be super freaky is if I have two extra GPIO, I could put um, a USB type A port and then you could plug in a USB key, because that can be kind of fun too. Like if you're doing emulating or dumping of floppy disk images, you wouldn't even use a micro SD card. You could dump it straight to a USB key and then pull it out and like, you know, plug it into your computer. So, um, because we've got USB host working with mass storage on the RP2040 uh, pretty well. So some kind of weird stuff. So lots of pin configurations going to be needed. Um, but I think these are the interfaces I'm going to go with the laptop. 2x17 floppy, 2x50 SCSI, so 2x25 SCSI, and 2x10 disk 2. And then, of course, if you have a SCSI, you know, a D sub, um, you can get adapter cables. That I'm not worried about that would go from this. Or maybe I'll sell something that like plugs in and gives you um, SCSI connector output. All right, so that's some floppy stuff. Any, you have any questions, Phil? Or? 
keep going. Keep going. Okay, cool. All right, well, let's go uh, into the great search and we'll talk about the five volt power supply. Where in the world is that part I need? The great search with DJ Keen. The great search brought to you by DJ Keen. Eat a fruit every single week. Lady Ada, user power of engineering, help you guess you find the things you want on digikey.com. Lady Ada, what is this week's great search? Okay. So I'm working on this board that's going to interface with floppy disk drives like this one or like take this Apple II, disk two. And um, these are devices that need a lot of power. They need five and 12 volts and they need them at a couple amps a piece because they're driving motors, spinning them around um, very fast. And um, you need to have a good clean power supply that's five volts and 12 volts. And, um, you know, historically you could get these power adapters that would give you both five and 12, and they would actually plug in even directly into the um, uh, disk drive itself. But those are, they're actually kind of expensive and they're very specialized. And so I thought in this design for this board that's gonna interface with disk drives, um, Apple II or floppy or whatever, that instead of trying to like get this custom source five plus 12 volt power adapter, what I would do is say, you just provide me five volts, sorry, 12 volts at three or four amps. You can get 12 volt, three or four amp power adapters or USB-C can provide 12 volts at three amps as well. And I'll give you the three, I'll give you the three, two to three amp five volt output as well as at 12 volts and then you know you're good to go you don't have to have like a dual supply i'll generate the five from the 12. so let's go to the computer and i'll i'll show this isn't the final design but i, I want to sort of draft it out so you'd have um your 2.1 millimeter dc jack and again you can get 12 volts power supplies very easily i'll add an e-fuse here we'll cover that probably next week on the great search about how to do e-fusing because i want to make sure that people don't plug in more than 12 volts into here and accidentally you know put 12 volts into the motor because i don't want to have a buck converter also for 12 volts i'm and i don't want to have a sepic i don't want to spend the extra money when i'd rather have a fuse and just be like hey just make sure you use a 12 volt i won't let you use anything else and then i'll give you the five volt um, high current as well. So there's USB-C, but again, USB-C does not it, even, you know, yes, if you have a power delivery setup, you can kind of guarantee getting five volts at two or three amps. But I'd rather just, again, generate it from this uh, chonky 12 volt power supply and use the USB just for communication to the computer, not try to use it for um, power input, because again, you need a lot of current. You need like two amps, one amp, but let's say two to, to be safe. Um, and so normally, you know, if I'm trying to, uh, get, um, you know, five volts from a 12 volt power supply on something like, um, you know, a Metro or something, I'll use like an AZ 1117 series. These are very, very common. They'll give you about one, um, one amp, one, you know, 0.25 amps linear. And uh, they come in your standard SOT223 or SOT89. Um, they're very inexpensive. You can see they're about 10 cents a piece in quantity, but, and they come in fixed as well. So I can get, you know, I can, let's say, um, I want a fixed uh, five volt output. Let me show you a couple options. Yeah, so the AZ5. 10 cents a piece and they work great. You know, you can get one amp out and the voltage drop is pretty minimal. I think it's, yeah, about 1.3 volts. So definitely will get you current out of 12 volts. The problem is that the amount of heat we're dissipating out of this is uh, pretty high. So, you know, 12 minus five, seven volt drop times, you know, 1.2 two amps okay eight watts you're not going to easily dissipate eight watts from this little package you could do it with a to220 with a really big ass heat sink but you're definitely not going to be like this chip is not going to be happy it'll it'll give you five volts one amp maybe from like seven to nine volts okay but not from 12 even though the um voltage rating can go up to 15 and that's something to watch out for like when i was like younger and i was starting out i was like oh it says I can do 15, it'll give me five at one amp. Like, 
it should, it should work, right? But it just because the the uh, technical limits let you do it doesn't mean the thermal limits will match. So for this kind of situation, this is where you would want a buck converter. This is a perfect example of you want a high voltage convert to low and you and you can't dissipate that much power. Also, it's a bit of a waste, right? I have to provide both five and 12 volts to, you know, a, a disk to power, uh, Apple disk to floppy drive. So I don't want to like linearly lose two amps from my 12 volt power supply into the five volt regulator, even if I did have a gigantic heat sink, because I still need two amps from the 12 volt as well. So, you know, if I use a buck converter, I can draw 400 milliamps from the 12 volt. I just need a less power, a less big power supply. So cost, power, everything savings, the buck converter is the way to go. So um, let's look at a, a DC DC buck converter and what you got. There's a lot of options. So there's just FYI, don't forget, they're switching controllers and switching regulators and switching converter like there's there's like a lot of things that sound very very similar so these converters tend to be modules and there's nothing wrong with using modules sometimes you're like oh, i don't want to go through like getting inductors and stuff you can get uh you know the, this chunky module from spark fun or you can get this you know plug-in style and there's nothing wrong with these um uh, they can be very inexpensive however you know i want to keep it low cost um and i'm not sure the power requirements here aren't too high so let's do um a regulator that will also regulate the output the controllers by the way usually you need to connect up a separate um transistor and these are often used for extremely high current um or extremely high voltages where you need the transistor to be spec for some you know maybe 40 50 volts or whatever um and you wouldn't get that with a regulator but 12 to 5 that's pretty common by the way like you're gonna see there's thousands of options so the regulator will give me a regulated output so many options thirty thousand uh and a lot of them are in stock too so let's look at only the active ones and let's look at the ones that are normally stocked and let's exclude the marketplace ones this gets us down to like a paltry seven thousand options okay and uh you know definitely there's there's tons and there's in stock. It's amazing. Uh, it's a beautiful thing. So we want surface mount because I'm going to pick and place it onto this board. Um, I want it to be definitely not negative. I want it to be positive, but sometimes we're positive or negative, whatever. I'll just select all of these. So all positive. And then I want, I only need one output. Um, although, you know, it could be interesting um, if I did need a lot of current at three volts. I could get a dual output that would give me 12 to 5 and 12 to 3, but I don't actually need that much current at 3 volts. I'm going to just toss an LDO on there um, to, con to convert the 5 volts to 3 volts because I only need like at the most 50, maybe 100 milliamps. Not worth getting another uh, more complicated um, buck setup going on. Okay, so let me apply. I didn't even get rid of that many. There's so many options. Um, okay. So the next uh, thing is, do I want synchronous rectifier or not? So normally I would say, you know, oh, I don't mind putting a, a diode in. I'll show you the freewheeling diode. Um, I, you know, I picked uh, this old design that I had. So like this design with the TPS 5100, there is a freewheeling diode here, um, but you know, it's another component and these diodes are not inexpensive. They're, you know, 10, 10 15 cents so let's go with yes let's do you know a synchronous rectifier um why not save one component also means usually there's a true disconnect um between input and output usually uh, at least it does with the boost converters okay and then i definitely want not boost i want buck only so I'll select those okay there's really you know Almost everything will do what I want. Voltage input, the minimum. Well, um, it's going to be 12 volt input. So let's make sure that I can handle um, 12 volt or less. And then uh, input maximum. Let's make sure the maximum can be whoops, 14 volts or higher. 
I go to 150, who cares? Let's see if that, okay, now we're getting down to 2,600. Um, let's look for only ones that are tape and reel. Just, you know, if I'm, I'm going to put this on the pick and place, I might as well get, you know, avoid the digi reel and cut tape version or, or uh, tray versions. Okay. And I think, like, that's pretty good. Voltage outputs. Um, they all kind of cover five volts. So, you know, I mean, again, this is like one of the most common um, converters. All right, so let's uh, let's look at the pricing quantity for a thousand pieces. That likes to like to give me a sense, and yeah, two thousand options. There's a lot of options, so you don't have to worry about that. Oh, and then current output. Duh, forgot most important thing. Um, so the motors on these um, they are usually spec'd for one amp, but um, you know I want to make sure I have plenty of um, space in my, my power uh, budget. So I'm gonna make the current output or the switch output be uh, two amps or more, because while this is um, this floppy, these floppies are one amp. There could be older ones that are less efficient and they could spike up and maybe draw like two amps. So let's do two amps and up. I don't know, 50 amps is kind of bonkers, but we'll see. Okay. So now, now we're doing good. Okay, so lots of in-stock options. And one thing I noticed is there's a couple of, uh, you know, popular winners here. There's the AP622 series from Diodes Inc. And notice that um, buck converters are really inexpensive, um, like 13 cents, 10 cents, about the same price as the LDO, which is another thing. It's like by the time you add the heat sinking to your linear regulator, um, because you have to get a separate heat sink. It could be the same price as just getting, this is a synchronous box. So all I need is the input capacitance, output capacitance, and a couple of inexpensive passives um, to set the output voltage and, um, you know, an inductor. But the inductors are usually, you know, maybe 10, 10, 15 cents. This is very inexpensive. Um, and there's a lot of good options. There's three volt out, sorry, three amp out, two amp out. I did see like, there's a lot of like, there's the TPS, five six two two zero two and then the tps five six two two zero seven and i was like what's the difference between these two and um so i opened up the data sheets because I was, I was expecting this to this week and i was like what is the difference between these two so a lot of it is um the accuracy of the output feedback and also the frequency um these are 580 and of course the lower the frequency, the more efficient, but the bigger the inductor. So if you want a small inductor, you'll want higher frequency, but usually get lower efficiency. So it's a kind of a trade-off, but um, 600 kilohertz isn't too bad. And also the voltage range input and output. So this is 4.317. These are actually kind of very similar. I don't even know. What are the differences between the two? And then, yeah, I don't even know. Soft start, hiccup mode, non-latch. I don't know the difference between the two, these two. Pre-bias function, I don't know. You can also check out on um, TI. These seem like almost identical. This is a thing, I wish there was a little bit more clear what the, the differences are between the two. Um, but the second digit, so there's five six, which is the TPS five six, which is the series, and then two is two amp, three is three amp. So at the same price, you can also get a three amp version, by the way. Um, there's also this the six two two zero one. Let me see the data sheet. Yeah, so this output output range is 0.76 to seven volts. And this is 0.8 to 7. So like there's this slight, they all clearly they're all very, very similar. They have the same um, FETs inside and the same kind of configuration and pinout. Um, but they have slightly different uh, pin numbers. I don't know. Some of them maybe have different compensation on the inside. All of them look pretty good though. Um, I think... I'm, you know, I'm one of those people who I, I definitely can be convinced by what the crowd is doing. So I actually decided 
of all these, I think the diodes one is good, but I kind of like this one just because these two, because both of these have um, like 100,000 and 20,000 in stock. So they're very promising. You could also go to the power designer, which is what, if you want like more specific component selection. And what I put in here is the VN like 10 volts to 14 volts and the output five volts and then, you know, 1.5 amps. And then uh, let's just say low cost. And the TI uh, web bench will generate, it'll actually, you, you'll see the same part number show up, but it'll, it'll calculate for you, your inductors, um, the about capacitance that you want for, you know, ideal stability and the feedback um, resistors. Thankfully, you don't have to compensate the design. So let this run in the mean, in the meantime, it'll generate the designs. But I think that this one is kind of what I'm going to go with the TPS 56 2202 or 2201. And you can see here's the, um, my screen is very small, but you can see um, it generated of this same family, the 56.3, 56.3, 56.4. So it goes up to four amps. Um, it likes to, I will say that the um, TI Webbench likes to kind of give you a, a bigger than maybe necessary uh, power budget. Um, but you can follow this and you can see like, you know, entire bomb cost of like 51 cents. It's a really good deal. These are also um, higher frequency chips, it looks like. The 5622 is of the 202. But they're all good. I think this whole family will probably work quite nicely. Very simple, very small, and fairly good efficiency. V out 5 volts. You know, up to two amps, about 92%, which is about as good as you're going to get. So, yeah, I think that this is what I'm going to go with, the TPS 56 22 series. So I'm going to get this into my design. And then next week, um, we'll do the e-fuse for protection of this chip to make sure that you don't get more than about 12, 14 volts coming in. And that's a great search. Wait. All right. Thank you so much for joining us this Sunday. We'll see everybody well, during the week. Just the floppy drive on the computer. That's right. We'll see everybody during the week. Lots of posts and more. Thank you so much for supporting us and an independent open source hardware company in New York City. We very much appreciate it. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Have a great week.